Hi everyone, this is Fiona Apollo, and I do art commentary. Happy holidays! Are we excited for the end of 2022? I know some people are. This year has actually been really good for me in terms of YouTube though. I had a few videos do really well and I'm slowly understanding more about what kind of topics people want to hear from me. I still want to do my own thing, but I have some ideas of how to rejig my content so that everyone's happy, so look forward to that at the beginning of next year. Speaking of which, today I want to talk about being autistic online. Specifically, I wanted to kind of go into why there seems to be a surprisingly large amount of autistic people in fandom spaces in particular, and how that influences both the people and the goings-on of these communities. I'm interested in talking about this because in the last half decade or so, it's taken a lot for me to better understand autism on multiple places in the spectrum. And being in fandom spaces has been quite a large contributor to helping deconstruct my previous biases. For most of my life, I've actually helped look after my brother, who is very much considered to be on the quote-unquote severe end of the autism spectrum, and as a result, this ended up skewing my perception of autism spectrum disorder quite a bit, especially considering I'm now coming around to the idea that I might have it myself, but on the opposite end. This also happens to be why I'm focusing on autism in particular, because it's what I have the most experience and knowledge of, as opposed to something like ADHD, for example, even though I'm aware that there may be some overlap between the two, as well as with a couple of other disorders. For a very long time, I couldn't fathom the idea of people thinking they had autism when they could talk normally, live independently, and things like that. That was just a very alien concept to me, but I've thankfully learned since then, and I want to use this as an opportunity to gain a better understanding of it by exploring it within communities that I frequently partake in. I'm still not quite ready to embrace the label yet, as it does come with some emotional baggage. As you can imagine, it impacted my childhood quite a lot to have a very autistic sibling and also be struggling with it myself without knowing, but hanging around in fandom and internet spaces and hearing more people both describe their experience and come to similar realizations has been, uh, <laughs> well, it's been something. And I think that's why exploring it in this way is so interesting to me. The idea that for so many, their special interest in a particular TV show or cartoon helps to contribute to this really dedicated and lively fan base that helps certain projects and people to thrive is such a wonderful thing to behold. I think there's something special to be said about the kind of camaraderie autistic people are able to find within these spaces, and the same can be said for other communities as well. What initially sparked my interest in doing a video on this right now is that a study was being shared around on TikTok a short while ago about how autistic people had a stronger sense of morality and were a lot more set in their beliefs than allistic people, and this can be interpreted as either a positive or negative depending on how you look at it. People who have a stronger moral obligation to do right by others can be a very good thing that we honestly need more of in the world. It's the mark of a decent human being to care about things, I think. But this study also made me wonder about whether or not this can have its own set of detriments when let loose in online spaces that can often become echo chambers. Things like very heated debates and arguments over what kind of ships are morally superior and anything lesser is somehow implicit in some kind of heinous act, gatekeeping what certain people can create works of, and even becoming incredibly defensive or even hostile when a show they like is criticised. All of these are, for me at least, what initially sprang to mind. This of course can't all be pinned onto one group, because that's not fair and just factually not the case, but that can be said for pretty much any topic, and I don't think it hurts to explore certain groups individually, so long as it's done with the understanding that we are not trying to use them as some kind of scapegoat. My videos are created with the intention to learn, understand, and uplift when possible. There will always be biases, as is the case with anything, and there will always be critiques as well, as well as misunderstandings, but I do try to be both as empathetic and impartial as I can, and I sincerely hope that comes across. If it doesn't and I do mess up, and I, I do that often, I will admit, leave a comment below on how I can improve next time and I'll do my best to address it. Even if I don't find the time to respond to all of them, I do read most comments, I'm human and I'm gonna make mistakes, but I want to learn from them as well. And if you have any thoughts that you feel weren't mentioned or elaborated on enough in this video, feel free to say so. Feedback is greatly appreciated here. As always, please note that a lot of what I discuss in my videos is purely speculative and not based in fact unless stated otherwise. I just like to ramble, so be sure to do your own research before parroting anything I say. And of course, if you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe, it makes me very, very happy. Alright, with that said, let's stop waffling and begin, shall we? Part 1. Fandom. A sensory haven. Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD for anyone who doesn't know, is a very interesting disorder. It's described by the National Institute of Mental Health website as a neurological and developmental disorder that affects how people interact with others, communicate, learn, and behave. 
It's known as a spectrum disorder because it can range very wildly between how it affects people and their ability to live their lives. Some people, like me, are able to live with pretty minimal support, which can be something as small as someone just having a bit of patience with me, while some people, like my brother, might need round-the-clock help in a lot of different aspects. A common way that people used to refer to different autistic people is through what the community call functioning labels, and these labels will basically describe a person as either high or low functioning, minor or severe, visible or invisible, or some other such descriptor, and I'm explaining these terms because they tend to be what many people with a limited understanding of autism might be most familiar with, but it's important to understand that this line of thinking is now considered pretty outdated and very inaccurate. These categorizations do a lot to negatively impact allistic or non autistic people's ability to recognise either an autistic person's needs or their independence depending on where they think that person falls on the spectrum. It's been recommended in recent years to think of autism spectrum more like a colour wheel instead of the aforementioned descriptors, since the different traits involved can be prevalent within a variety of combinations, rather than just being split into mild versus extreme. Some common traits of autism, as noted on a quick google search, can include enhanced sensitivity, so anything from sensitive hearing, disliking certain sounds, tastes, textures, etc, an unconventional manner of speaking, either they can be very sing-songy or very rigid, quote unquote underdeveloped social skills, though personally a lot of the time this feels more so just social skills that aren't socially acceptable by holistic people's standards and not necessarily underdeveloped in my opinion, unusual eating or sleeping habits, and unconventional mood or emotional reactions. Not every autistic person has all of these qualities, and it's important to note that as autism is a spectrum, no two people are going to be the same, but most people are generally seen as having at least one or two of these traits. The main ones we are going to focus on for this video are concerning enhanced sensitivity, social skills, and emotional reactions, as I feel these are the ones that are best able to shine through in an online space. If you want to understand more about the traits of autism, or are interested in seeing whether you fall on the spectrum, it's often recommended to look into the DSM-5. The DSM-5 is a standard classification of mental disorders and is considered to have the most up-to-date criteria for helping to diagnose a variety of mental disorders, including autism. I'll provide a link to this and my other sources in the description. Please note that there's no clear-cut way to get hold of a perfectly accurate diagnosis, so if you do end up looking into the DSM-5, please try to only use it as a guideline and don't take it as gospel. So with that out of the way, to start, how does autism or specific traits of autism factor into fandom and internet culture? Quite a bit of this discussion is going to be me riffing off possible ideas of why we may be drawn to certain aspects of fandom, so a few things I discuss here aren't going to be especially based in fact, just for reference, so please keep that in mind if I seem to be outright stating anything as fact without giving sources. Starting off with enhanced sensitivity, this is definitely something I recall with my brother a lot. When he doesn't like a sound or the sight of something, he will shrink away from it, but when he does like something, be it a song or maybe his favourite colour shows up in a movie, he will play it on the highest possible settings, and you will not believe the amount of display and sound systems we had to replace because of that growing up. I also recall that when he liked a certain toy because it was colourful, he would line them up by colour just to admire the progression. Uh, I did this too, and actually still kind of do it with a lot of my art supplies. <laughs> But even I find that when I like a good song, I'll turn the volume up and down according to how well the instruments or vocals scratch my brain. Obviously, this on its own is not a trait that is restricted to autism, but I've definitely had holistic friends comment on how loudly or quietly I play music compared to them. It's like a mega dopamine hit, and it often feels insatiable until you hit a point where you overindulge and need to back off. And it's a similar thing that can happen with other disorders like ADHD as well. And I think when we look at this through a fandom lens, I have a feeling there might be a correlation as to why fandoms and a lot of autism autistic people in general gravitate towards mediums like animation and games. Stuff like nostalgia can definitely factor in, but when you look at how bright, well-lit, and better audibly structured a lot of these mediums are compared to live action, you start to wonder if all of this contributes to how much better they cater to autistic people's sensory preferences. Looking at sound specifically for a moment, you know how when watching a movie on a streaming site, quite a lot of people will comment on how they can't hear the dialogue during action scenes? I think this could be a contributor to certain people preferring one medium over another, and I've heard this as a complaint from both autistic and allistic people as well, so it's not an isolated issue involving one group. Well, I think I actually know why this happens. 
There was a person on TikTok who actually explained this really well, and the reason as far as I've seen is because movies adopt a stereo surround sound method of sound design that doesn't exactly translate from screen to a single soundbar in front of your TV or through your phone speaker, because the sound is designed to be immersive and you're supposed to watch these movies in cinemas. Yes, we may still have stereo, but the capacity of stereo versus stereo surround sound is a little bit different. If you want the full experience, then you're supposed to have surround sound speakers in your living room that allow the quieter dialogue moments to be heard behind you to simulate someone talking nearby, while the explosions and fighting sounds occur a short distance in front of you to help create an immersive balance. Essentially, modern sound design in certain genres doesn't seem to have quite caught up to the era of streaming catered towards individuals, or contrastingly, many film companies will skip out on remixing the audio for streaming. Modern animation and games are structured to be watched through devices like an iPad or laptop and accompanied with headphones meant for one person, as well as allowing people to have complete control over their graphic settings depending on how powerful a device they may be playing on, meaning that there's no real need for things like sound effects to overtake the dialogue. When we look at visual draws, I think genres like anime in particular also attract autistic people because of the visually dynamic and distinctive styling that is used to push the narrative. Obviously, this is done in a lot of mediums and stories, but in drawn or computer-based mediums, things such as the colour contrast tend to be a lot higher, making it more obvious and easier for people of all types to catch on to certain subtext, not just necessarily autistic people. And I'm not talking about having so many bright colours in a shot that it's like an assault on the eyes. I mean in the sense of a character having a bright hairstyle, for example, while the rest of the scene is quite muted in order to have them be the centre of focus. For a group of people who struggle with social cues, these kinds of subtleties help a lot more with understanding the tone of a narrative. This is also spoken about in a video by the BBC talking about why autistic people gravitate towards manga, and one autistic interviewee alluded to it being that in manga and anime, a lot of character actions and movements are exaggerated and therefore easier to understand, and I think it's safe to say that this can extend to western comics and webcomics as well. I do also just want to throw in a quick observation that if you're watching something with high visual contrast, that can also affect your sleeping habits, which abnormal sleeping patterns was an aforementioned trait found in many autistic people, so if you're autistic and have any sleep troubles, it's probably not recommended to watch an episode of your favourite anime right before bed. Also, this is just something I came across when doing research and didn't initially realise that this may be the number one example of neurodivergency in a fandom, but there seems to be a surprising amount of videos about autism in the furry community, which I'll admit, I wasn't prepared for, but at the same time, I think it's a great example of what I'm talking about. Furries, as we all know, are very dedicated to what they do. They have a very tight-knit community, they're extremely serious about their hobbies. Fursuits, for example, are often painstakingly crafted and can take thousands of hours and even thousands of dollars to make, and they are typically viewed with having many conflicting accounts from all sides because, sadly, people often fear or ridicule what they don't fully understand. And there's also the added downside of the bad apples in a group creating a bad impression for onlookers. As it turns out, there's a video on YouTube that was uploaded by a university detailing that around 5-15% to of the furry community are autistic, which is actually pretty massive. The speaker in the video, Dr Elizabeth Fane, details how things like fursuits in particular help to act as a kind of buffer for autistic furries, kind of like a shield in terms of both social and sensory aspects. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that a bit of that might come from the fact that because you're already wearing a big fuzzy mask, you don't have to mask your facial expressions and as a result, probably don't feel as drained socially because of it. Autistic people apparently also told Dr Fane that they're more inclined to tolerate physical contact like hugs when wearing fursuits as well because of this, which was incredibly interesting. You know, it's kind of funny how when you actually accommodate autistic people's needs and respect them, we do in fact start to behave in a way that neurotypicals want us to because, well, we're finally comfortable. Even if it's something a little bit, you know, out of this world, like a fursuit, it's not inherently wrong, it's not bad, and if it makes someone more comfortable, then what's the harm? I'm not very, by the way. <laughs> But I think this was an extremely informative video. Any research videos or articles I mentioned, by the way, again, will be included in the description below. So that's the more sensory side looked into, but how about the more social side? Part 2. Community and belonging. Oh no, I can feel the cold coming on. <laughs> I'm only halfway through. Please pray for me. So when looking into our point regarding social skills, why fandom specifically? What's so special in regards to movies, TV shows and pop culture that draws people in, let alone autistic people? 
to help me with this, I wanted to figure out if there were any distinctions as to why autistic people gravitated towards fandom, what they thought of it, and to a lesser extent if there were any prominent subgroups of people who found solace in these communities as well. For example, we already know that a lot of fandoms have large LGBTQ plus followings as well, so I wanted to try and gather some statistics on how much of these groups tended to cross over and theorise on why that might be. After chatting with some people to make sure I was asking the right questions as respectfully as I could, I released a survey on the matter which ended up getting almost 60 responses. Obviously with it being such a small sample size and the fact that it's coming from people within my sphere of influence, the results are going to be unavoidably skewed in some form, and it does look like that ended up becoming the case. But nevertheless, it's what we've got. So just looking at the data we've gathered, the average person filling out the survey seems to be aged between 17 and 21 years old, they were either a cisgender girl or non-binary, and they were asexual, which was kind of surprising. In hindsight, I don't know if I should have included the option for people to state their race too, but after my Blacktober video I'll admit I was a bit hesitant on that, so that's on me. I got a bit caught up in some backlash from a small group in the comments of that video and got a bit worried that I may have been homing in on race a bit too much as a white woman, so I do apologise. I do also just want to mention that I wasn't aware at the time that it was preferred to use identity first language, so basically saying autistic person instead of person with autism. Uh, thank you to everyone who pointed that out, hopefully I've managed to correct every instance of that within the script, but if you do notice it anywhere, please know that it's not intentional. Now, just looking at those initial three things, it can be assumed from the survey and from general knowledge of fandom that the biggest or loudest demographic online tends to be young girls and gender non-conforming folks. We all know that men have their own version of fandom, and yes, sports, cars, and conventionally manly interests can be considered fandoms, but whether there is a larger percentage of autistic girls in particular in fandom online as opposed to other spaces can't be fully determined. I've been doing a lot of research lately into autism in girls both for myself and this video, and I initially thought that special interests for autistic girls tended to lean more towards creative pursuits rather than what is considered conventional interests for autistic people in general, but as it turns out, that's actually not quite the case and is instead more so related to how society treats girls in general. Girls are pushed out of sport, sciences, and other such pursuits more frequently, and as a result, this can also have a knock-on effect leading to this potentially false idea that girls are much more willing to be part of fandoms when in fact, boys may theoretically like fandom just as much but are similarly pushed towards other things. It's also worth noting that these aspects may well have also skewed the results of the survey since it's likely that my own content caters heavily to autistic girls and non-binary folks. Because autism is thought to be more prevalent in boys even today, it was never really considered what the aspects and traits girls exhibited would be, and whether those are influenced more so by society, and that's possibly why we have so many potentially autistic girls who are undiagnosed. It's been proven time and again with countless studies that there isn't actually all that much distinction in terms of girls' capabilities compared to boys, but the societal expectations placed onto them nearly always made it so that girls were expected to underperform by comparison, even if the actual data proved otherwise. There's also the issue of women or AFAB biology wherein there isn't as much study put into how our bodies function compared to men's. For example, a lot of people are only just finding out in recent years that the symptoms of a heart attack are different for men and women, because men's symptoms were mistaken to be the standard across the board up until very recently. And yet, despite that evidence, it was still thought that men were more prone to heart attacks because the male symptoms were more widely recognised. If we want to look into gender and sexuality in respect to this survey, a way this could be explained is that the internet is considered much safer to be out and proud on as opposed to real life for a lot of closeted people, and if we want to try to draw a connection to this and autism, it could be a case that when people are able to accept one aspect of themselves, it becomes progressively easier to consider the idea that there may well be other aspects to them as well. When you've already come to terms with the fact that you're queer, for example, you may not be quite as guarded about the idea that you might also be autistic, and it doesn't end up feeling Feeling like such a gut-wrenching thing as a result. It can feel a lot more normalised and less terrifying because you've already done this dance once before. So getting into the more fandom-centric parts of the survey, out of about 55 responses, and also bear in mind all questions were optional, around 77% said they engaged in fandom communities, however minimal the engagement may be, with a significant amount of people saying that they preferred to engage in smaller communities where they feel safer to express themselves with their favourite things. A lot of people mentioned that they don't get treated as much like an outcast or a weird online, as well as liking the fact that so much additional content outside of canon is available that caters to their special interests. When I asked about what they thought could be improved in fandom, the majority mentioned that toxicity was a huge issue. People getting very heated in debates, 
becoming very defensive of certain stories or characters, even issues regarding parasocial relationships were mentioned. There seemed to be an emphasis on how people felt there was a degree of inflexibility when it came to how people think media should be consumed, and I can definitely attest to seeing that in a few fandoms. In the really huge ones like My Hero Academia, for example, it often feels that once the most popular headcanon has been established, some people will take that to mean that it's practically canon and talk down to those who think otherwise, which <laughs> no, 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 that's not how fandom works, but yeah, whatever. I also asked if they thought that the issues they mentioned, be it toxicity, misinformation or something else, were the result of fandom or were merely symptoms of a bigger issue, and I asked this because I wanted to see if people thought that the things being discussed negatively were only being talked about at all because they were in regards to fandom. I found throughout most responses that people mused on the idea that they were symptoms of a bigger issue. Two big ones that kept coming up were parasocial relationships and a refusal to accept when an opinion is wrong. And looking at those points, yeah, those definitely aren't issues that can be contained within a fandom bubble. A lot of problems that people have with fandom can be a combination of things that stem from society in general, and not necessarily something that can be pinned down and nipped in the bud overnight. It's a shame, really, because if they were, things would be so much easier and I don't think there would be nearly as much infighting. When looking at characters in media, I asked if people felt that they related to or identified with any autistic-coded characters in media, and about 64% said yes, with another 30% saying they did occasionally, but then I asked whether they thought it was easy to identify an autistic fan within a fandom space, and 62% answered they weren't sure, with 28% saying yes. I think some of these questions were probably a bit contradictory in hindsight, and I asked them more so because I wasn't fully sure yet how to go about getting the most well-rounded information out of this survey that I could. I did also ask people why they thought this, and this prompted quite a range of answers. Some stated that not every autistic fan is obvious from behind a computer screen, nor would they want to be, which is completely valid. The ones who supposedly answered yes elaborated that this was mostly because some would often just straight up say, I'm autistic. Some mentioned that when you're in such a niche space where talking about a singular topic as much as possible is encouraged, this makes it a lot harder to tell autistic fans from neurotypicals, and then some said it was easier because autistic people just attract other autistic people, kind of like a gaydar. All of these answers are perfectly understandable, none of them are strictly right or wrong. It was definitely an interesting read going through and seeing what people thought, that's for sure, but we're also not quite done yet. So my next question was, when initially putting out the feelers for this topic, there was quite a substantial response to do with morality that was closely linked to things such as shipping, e.g. pro-anti-shipping, viewing certain ships as inherently wrong, etc. Do you think this is something that autistic people in particular feel very strongly about? And quite a hefty bunch agreed that yes, it is something that autistic people feel strongly about, some of whom went into detail about how such things made them feel. The biggest takeaway from this question is that you guys take your shipping really seriously, and I think that's both an admirable thing, but also something to be wary of in relation to others, not because I think you're wrong for being passionate, but mostly because the internet is full of trolls, and it would be a shame for you guys to get mixed up with that. One person in particular mentioned that the reason this may be the case is because these characters are a lot simpler to learn about and understand because many of them are two-dimensional compared to real people, and that allows people to project more of their personalities and traits onto them, which I thought was an extremely interesting take. So what I can only assume from that is when someone criticises that character, of course it would feel like much more of a personal attack. This answer actually really helped me to rationalise in my brain how some people can be so attached to certain characters, so thank you. And finally, I asked if people thought that the previous question relates to how autistic people view the world, or if they believed it was strictly an internet phenomenon. With this question, I'd say that the responses were 50-50 on whether this was the case or not. The ones who argue that it is theorise that it was the case of real world versus fictional world, and that the actions of those online aren't always synonymous with how they might think or behave in the real world, but the ones who said no seem to collectively agree that a person can still hold the values of what they share online outside of it, even if they may not express those values around real people. The rest of the answers tended to state themselves that it's a yes and no kind of scenario, and there was also some discussion around how this kind of perception ties into the stereotype of autistic people having childish interests. Personally with this, I don't think that being passionate about something is childish just because the subject matter itself might be aimed towards a certain age group. Being childish in my mind would be the act of disregarding other people's views and opinions in favour of always wanting to be the one sitting on a moral high ground, but that's just me. Can autistic people fall into that? Some can, sure, but I've also met dozens of neurotypical people who are just as bad for that, if not worse, so it's kind of hard to say. But regardless, thank you to everyone who took part in this survey, it was hugely helpful reading everyone's responses, and to cap this section off because it is easily the biggest by a mile, I'll read out some notable additional comments some of you left at the end, and then we can move on. I'll also be linking the survey's findings below with all my other research. 
If I don't read yours out, it is purely due to time and length because I do have a proofreader reading this time around, so I'm sorry in advance. I don't agree with the recent trend of black and white moral thinking for media, and maybe it's just a loud minority, but I think it's a trend that needs to stop. The lack of critical thinking or reading comprehension is appalling, and I think people need to follow the don't like don't read thing again. TLDR, autistic people don't care about things more, we're just more likely to speak against things we don't like. Also, fandom policing comes from a wider cultural problem of controlling people and taking freedom away which is present on and offline. The internet and anonymity made it so people would do slash say things they otherwise never would, so a lot of behaviours depend on the media genre being consumed, these people's circles, countries, age, free time, etc. I am autistic, and I also wanted to add that it is extremely important to remember that autism is a spectrum, so every autistic is different. Some may be involved in some of the behaviours you've mentioned, and some won't. We're different in the same way every neurotypical is different from each other. Part 3. Morality and Extremes so, looking at the previous section, we can theorise that fandom ties in well to a sense of community and autistic people's special interests. Escapism was something I also wanted to try and find a correlation to, but it looks like that kind of fell to the wayside a bit, which is a shame. But at the same time, it can kind of be difficult to prove regardless. If I was to ruminate on that myself though, I think many people go to online fandom spaces because it's something to put your energy into when other things might be bothering you. It can be a comfort, a distraction, even an aid to help people deal with difficult situations that can often be exacerbated for autistic people. It can help them to recharge and even process things before they log off again. It's been speculated now that people can tell when you have a hint of autism either consciously or unconsciously, and this can especially be the case when growing up and it leads to a lot of autistic people adopting a behaviour known as masking, which is basically when you subdue certain behaviours in favour of not being singled out by neurotypical people. Some autistic people are very good at masking to the point where they actually really struggle to stop, and some can't really mask at all. Again, we're talking about a spectrum here. I've seen a good few people on TikTok especially in recent months delving into how they've started realising that even from a young age, people are able to detect neurodivergency in their peers and for allistic people, this often leads to them feeling unnerved by it and finding ways to keep a distance, which sadly, often manifests as them bullying these peers. People often shun what they don't understand and that's an upsetting reality for a lot of people across the board. Online behind screens and text though, it's much harder to detect and you're less likely to be harassed on that alone. Yes, people will still get picked on when certain groups find out if someone is autistic, but generally, the internet does a good job of muddying the waters perception-wise. Especially if you choose not to show your face and use an avatar, such as what I and many other people do. Not saying that everyone who does that is autistic, obviously, but it certainly has a few parallels to masking in public, which I personally think could explain why so many people choose to do it aside from the obvious factors such as, you know, privacy. <laughs> So how does this play into fandom spaces, and how does it positively or negatively impact them? The best way I personally think we can look into this is firstly through representation. When we look at the representational aspect in fiction, autistic people actually have a bit of variety, which is to be expected because, again, autism is a spectrum. I'm gonna keep yammering this same phrase for my own sake as well as for viewers, by the way. However, this can be a bit of a mixed bag depending on the genre we're discussing. There does seem to be a distinction between the way live action and cartoons depict it, for example. Live action tends to have a bigger focus on the stereotypical autistic archetype of being extremely intelligent, but lacking in the more social aspects. And some of this can be based in truth, as Paige Lael, a YouTuber who focuses on discussing autism, talks about how a lot of autistic people excel at using one side of the brain as opposed to switching between the two like what neurotypical people do. Some autistic people can be science prodigies, and some can be creative geniuses, but the second an activity requires more than one part of the brain, for example an intricate social interaction where certain exchanges may not be verbal or otherwise obvious, that's when things can become a bit of a challenge. In shows like The Big Bang Theory, Sheldon's ineptitude to comprehend typical social cues and preference towards touting his intelligence perfectly encapsulates this idea, I think. Whereas in cartoons, the focus tends to be put more on the character's ability to interact and form relationships with other people, even despite the understanding that yes, they behave differently. In contrast to live action where characters like Sheldon are still shaded by his friends for the way he acts, it's a far cry from cartoons like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles where Donatello is readily accepted by his brothers and is a valued member of the team. Since a lot of cartoons tend to have young demographics and therefore focus on teaching important lessons in their storylines, themes of acceptance and working things out are often viewed as a welcoming atmosphere for many different groups of people, and autism is no exception. 
The problem with that, though, is that because a lot of animated shows carry these types of messages, this can foster an environment of intense morality if these types of shows are the main or only thing people are consuming. Which on its own is not always a bad thing, and is definitely not contained to autism, but if you were to combine that with the nature of the internet, a place where things are often split by extremes and also have other factors contributing to what is effectively an echo chamber, this can end up sparking some issues. Now, while this morality aspect can cause problems, the majority of people are able to avoid this by curating their online spaces. The ones that don't, however, and this is usually the younger crowd who are still trying to learn some social dynamics online and are also easier to influence, they risk falling into a rabbit hole of trying to learn and enforce certain unspoken rules, and this can sometimes become pretty convoluted. For example, insinuating that a short person is quote-unquote minor coded and that shipping said person is normalising pedophilia both in and out of fiction. This is especially dangerous thinking in online spaces where people might be more inclined to take advantage of this for their own amusement and have people within the same communities turning on each other by feeding into false ideologies. This again is not just something that autistic people fall into the trap of, it's something that can affect literally anyone. It's just that autism is the focus of this video, so we need to try and view it through that specific lens. A lot of what I'm talking about in this section is related to the study of morality within autistic people, but we need to remember that everyone's idea of what is morally correct will be different, and the internet can sometimes make it more likely that these opposing views on the matter will end up clashing, regardless of what group of people are involved. And we also can't forget that sometimes people just don't want to do the right thing all the time. Some people just want to be arseholes, and autistic people aren't exempt from that notion either. More disturbingly as well, I've also been theorising as to whether this can make it easier for autistic people to fall into more extreme territories when searching for communities based on a combination of their special interests, as well as communities who align with their moral values. Especially if those moral values are still being moulded, or perhaps were moulded within a more volatile environment. Reddit is an especially prominent example of this issue. This is most definitely not because they are autistic, but more because people who are willing to manipulate others for their own gain will be able to pinpoint exactly how to do that for whatever group they target by pretending to play into their beliefs and twist them. And considering some autistic people already have difficulty reading others, it could be noticeably harder to realise when this is actually happening. And I don't think anything encapsulates those polar opposites online better than the whole pro-anti-shipping debacle. This is something that was consistently brought up when I first mentioned the topic on Twitter and also in the survey. I'm not going to delve super deep into it because that topic is a minefield and probably deserves its own video, but I do think it's something to keep note of in the back of your mind. Just like how some people can have very strong left-leaning ideologies, the same can be said for people who end up in communities that prioritise very right-wing sensibilities as well. And when we throw autism and the idea that autistic people are much more headstrong in what they believe in, I think that can be an extremely worrying combination if all the conditions are met. But, of course, we are talking about the most extreme scenarios here, and pretty much everything I'm saying here is theoretical. The vast majority of people, particularly neurodivergent people from what I've seen, aren't that prone to just being so willfully led down a bad path, and like to stick to their own bubbles and don't like to cause a lot of issues. But I just thought this was something interesting to mention so that anyone listening can potentially look out for when this is happening. With all of this being said, I think that's about as much as I can cover for this one video. So with that, I will end it here. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope that you found this interesting and were able to learn a little in the process. Above all, autistic people are just another community doing their own thing online, and I think going into this really helped to understand them a bit more. I definitely wasn't aware of things like the furry fandom being such a positive space for autistic people, but after doing a bit of research, that makes so much more sense. It was also cool to see how there were so many varied responses to the survey corroborating that autism is indeed, once again, a huge spectrum. I've never really been given the chance to look introspectively into why I talk, think, or behave the way that I do, so this video is a way for me to kickstart that journey. Who knows? I might figure out further down the line that I'm not autistic and actually have something else, but I'm a firm believer that it never hurts to broaden your own understanding of something. And also watching a lot of Paige Laley's videos may have given me a slight identity crisis. But anyway, if you like this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. This is actually my final long-form video of the year because Christmas is coming up and I want to have a chance to both take a break and also revamp some things for the coming year. I have a lot of stuff planned for 2023, so wish me luck. Thank you so much to Chloe for proofreading all of this, your comments were really helpful and I tried to take as many on board as I could. And one last thing, a big, big thank you to everyone who took part in the Draw This In Your Style challenge we hosted in the Discord server for the channel's two year anniversary. There was a huge range in styles and interpretations and I couldn't be prouder of everyone who took part, you all did a fantastic job. Thank you so much again. 
Stay safe, everyone, and I will speak to you in the new year. Bye!